Sasha was only two and a half when she was diagnosed with autism and we were sent away with a leaflet for a support. I would go to these meetups with the mums and I'd think, Sasha sounds quite like their daughters, but there's just something didn't seem to fit quite right. She was different in some ways. That then led me to come home and start Googling, why does my daughter do this differently? That's when I came uh, across the term PDA online and these features and just thought my daughter ticks every one of these. So that's where we had that light bulb moment. Group, we have an older daughter who was two years older, a traditional parent methods were totally fine. She responded in a typical way to all of that, but it wasn't working, which is why we felt we needed to try something else and why we have had to have that complete mindset shift. It's not about us being in control and telling her what to do. It's about finding what she can do and what works best for her. So there wasn't a lot of people writing about it online or sharing social media. There, wasn't, yeah. there weren't videos and easier ways of getting this information. Initially, it was for us and our life to help our daughter be better understood by other people. But then as I've gone along, I have felt that I really want to help other families who've been in that position, who are being judged for what their child yeah. is not able to do and try and help them as well by bringing more awareness and understanding Hey, 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 everyone, and welcome back to the Calm the Chaos Parenting Podcast. Today, we are going to be diving into the world of PDA. And if you are wondering, what the heck did she just say? What does that mean? We're going to be diving into that. I am so excited to have on Steph Curtis. She is the author of PDA in the Family. It just came out recently. And I've been following Steph on social for quite some time. And so when I saw her book coming out, I was like, I want to have you on. I would love to talk about this on the podcast. Steph, welcome. I'm so excited you're here. Thank you. I am so pleased to be here. Yeah, we've got a lot to talk about here. First and foremost, can you just share a little bit about who you are and uh, what you do? I always introduce myself as Steph um, with two girls and they are 18 and 16 now, but it's our youngest daughter who was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half. So from that day, I actually started writing a blog online. So that's how I've got to where I am now and having the book published. I started a bit of a diary about her autism. She's 16 now, so that's 14 years I've been online and on social media. So quite a while I've been around. Hard to believe, right? I started yeah. 10 years ago and never intended to have a book or a membership or any of these things. Yeah. And it was just like that. It was a diary of the things that we were going through. I was doing it for only a few people. I thought, you know, people near to us and family who didn't live near. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I'm quite surprised how much it's grown. Yeah, that's amazing. And your book is about the experience after getting the diagnosis, but more than the autism diagnosis, it's digging into this subset of autism, which is PDA. Can you explain what this is and how it differentiates from just the overarching autism diagnosis. The subtitle of the book is Life After the Light Bulb Moment. And I think that kind of comes into our story. And as so many other people recognize this light bulb moment of PDA, PDA stands for pathological demand avoidance. And it's considered to be a profile or a type of autism, meaning that there's certain features or characteristics on top of autistic characteristics. As it was for our daughter, there was an autism diagnosis, but there's more kind of detail behind that. There's key features that are listed on the PDA Society website, and I will probably mention them again because they're the national charity here in the UK who have helped with understanding of PDA. So they say that there's six sort of key features. PDA is about resisting and avoiding the ordinary demands of life, so everyday demands. Um, PDAs would use social strategies as part of avoidance. So it's not just saying no, because you don't want to do it. Um, PDAs also appear sociable on the surface, which is not something that 14 years ago was said about many autistic individuals. Um, but there's a, a sort of a missing the understanding um, of those social kind of, of rules. And then there's um, mood swings and impulsivity are often always said to be found alongside PDA. Um, and then a focus, there's, I think the word obsessive is not a nice word, but that's often used with autism. Um, but for PDA, that can often be more about people rather than objects or, mm -hmm. you know, interests in that way. So slightly different. 
And then the last one is about um, being comfortable in role play and with imagination and pretending. Um, and often that can be to quite an extreme event where PDA individuals might sort of take up, take on the persona of, of someone or something else. So yeah, that's that the PDA in a nutshell. Yeah, that's really helpful. And what would you say led you to getting the diagnosis and then to not only that, did these come hand in hand first and all, did you get the autism diagnosis and the understanding of PDA at the exact same time? No. So, so Sasha was only two and a half when she was diagnosed with autism and we were sent away with a leaflet for a support group, actually other mums of autistic girls because girls that are having something in common and I would go along to these meetups with the mums and I'd think Sasha sounds quite like their daughters but there's just something didn't seem to fit quite right she was different in some ways and I guess that then led me to come home and start googling and say well why does my daughter do this differently to their their girls who as a group seemed fairly similar and then so that's when I came uh, across the term PDA online and these features and just thought my daughter ticks every one of these so that's yeah where we had that light bulb moment mm -hmm. and about how old was she when you had that light bulb moment so it was probably um, six to twelve months after diagnosis okay. so we're getting used to things yeah yeah, and that's really early in the awareness of PDA as a whole. It's become into the, it's come into uh, awareness a lot more just in the last two, three years, I would say. Yeah. But 14 years ago, there had to have yeah. been not a whole lot of information out there. No, and there wasn't a lot of people writing about it online or sharing social media. There wasn't yeah. really, I don't know if TikTok existed back then, but there weren't really videos and easier ways of getting this information. I like to think I've helped a little bit by sharing some of this information with other people. And that's, that is why I've carried on doing it. Initially, it was for us and our life to help our daughter kind of be better understood by other people. But then as I've gone along, I've felt that I really want to help other families who've been in that position who are being judged for what their child yeah. is not able to do and try and help them as well by bringing more awareness and understanding to this um, you know, type of autism. If you could get people to understand just one thing about PDA or a PDA profile, what would you want them to know? Yeah. Oh, I don't, narrowing it down to one is really difficult. I know. Give me <laughs> as first, many as you want. I know. The first yeah, thing that jumped into time, my mind, right? <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that jumped into my mind was the phrase can't, not won't. So it's mm -hmm. not about the fact that our daughter won't do things because she just doesn't want to, because she's being awkward or oppositional, or they're not fun things to do. It's that she can't. There's, there's underlying skills missing. Um, and that, that lack of understanding in some ways. So yeah, that's, I suppose, that the first thing that jumped out. But the, the other thing that is very close behind that is that it's a lot to do with anxiety for our daughter, that extreme anxiety. And a lot of those behaviors, if not a word I like, those reactions are to her anxiety when the demands are being placed on her. And it can be demands for things that she might enjoy doing. When she was younger, she used to love going swimming when she was little, but to actually leave the house to go swimming would be so difficult for her um, for a variety of reasons. But um, some of that was sensory issues, but we would unpick those, but there would still be an underlying the demand and just having to go and do something. Um, is too difficult. And that's still the case today. Yeah. So I was thinking in our Calm the Chaos book and on the podcast, a lot of times we talk about our Calm the Chaos framework, which is you connect, understand, empower. So really looking at PDA from a, a broader view. And I was wondering if we could just unpack some of those pieces, taking it in that order, since a lot of our listeners know that framework really well. So that would mean that we would start with the mindset shifts that are needed, mm -hmm. especially when you're looking at maybe when you mentioned this can't, not won't. That's a huge one. But were there some other important mindset shifts that needed to happen for you as the parent so that you could help your daughter? Yeah, I mean, everything really. It's like parenting all turned on its head. I think so many of us have, we either have an upbringing that we've loved and we want to do the same as our parents did or we go the other way and we try and make things different. But most of this hangs on traditional parenting and what society expects of us. And generally that is that the adult is in charge and they tell the child what to do. And that's the basic simple thing. And I think, and I, I'll go back to why the blog was called Steph's Two Girls, because we, we have an older daughter who was two years older and that worked for her. The traditional parenting methods 
were totally fine. She responded in a typical way to all of that. And that was another reason why we came to understand more about Sasha. So yeah, just kind of taking all those things. We would have liked to do that with Sasha, but it wasn't working, which is why we felt we needed to try something else. And while we have had to have that complete mindset shift, it's not about us being in control and telling her what to do. It's about finding what she can do and what works best for her. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I find that parents that we work with, even when maybe on the surface, they believe the whole all behaviors communication and it's can't, not won't, they still have a really hard time letting go of demands and really leaning into listening to what the child needs. Was there anything that helped you make that shift from traditional parenting to this new way of parenting? I'm going to say Sasha helped me because like I said, Sasha was very, very determined is a good word from the start and everything. And we have this to do and all the kind of reports of other places, settings she was in, like everything tended to be on her terms, which actually makes it sound like she was consciously deciding that, but it wasn't really for her. It was just part of her makeup. So yeah, that I think we just had to change. We were kind of made to change in that way, but something that also helped, and I say, I love Dr. Ross Green and hearing about him and his kind of methods and thought process and the whole idea that kids do well if they can. And oppositional was a word that was used about our daughter but at the age of two and I never felt it really fitted right it, it was mm -hmm. but there's also oppositional defiant disorder and our daughter was never defiant she never thought she was in control she never was doing all of this to be awkward and I think that is worth keeping in mind that actually it's, ni it's nice they're better for the children to be pleasing their parents in a way if that is what they can do and that makes them feel good then they will do it but yeah for our daughter it just wasn't possible yeah, and I want to give credit where credit's due because you're saying that it's her and you had to, but I see a lot of parents who they are being given the message by their children to try a different way, to do different than the way that they imagined parenting. And they are just like, nope, headstrong. Like <laughs> I'm the parent, I'm in charge and you will do what I say. And I think it comes from a fear of what happens when I lean into what you're what you're needing and when I drop those demands. Yeah. Did you have that? Yeah. No, I don't think I have the fear, but I could, I can understand that because I suppose there is the fear of what happens if you do this or you don't make your child do this now, then, then where do you get to? So that's part of it. But also I think society's expectations are so, they weigh so heavily on people worrying about what other people think about what they're doing in their own home. And that can be really difficult for people to let go of. And then also there's a little bit of, selfishness in there as well because you want to live your life the way that is easiest for you and makes you happy that doesn't necessarily always fit with what is best for your child so yeah it's it's a juggle it is it is a juggle and i don't want to jump to the punchline but your daughter you said she's 16 now and you've been doing this for a long time so you kind of have the end of not the end of the road we've still got a long way to go i've got an 18 year old who's autistic so i understand right mm -hmm. where it's not butterflies and rainbows ever but mm -hmm. What you now get to see what happens 14 years later, if you choose this path and you lean into what your child needs and you do believe that it's can't, not won't. And so what have you been able to see? Yeah. So there's, I mean, obviously there's all bits to that story and it's in the book. <laughs> um, and I, I finished the book when she was about 14 or a couple of years on from that. But Sasha is very happy in herself, right? healthy despite not eating a wide range of foods that the rest of society would, you know, should eat. So yeah, she's, she's doing well. She's not, there's still anxiety uh, that is very clear to see and more so now in, in some ways. And, but some of that comes with being a teenager anyway, and the whole the struggle and the hormones and trying to fit in. So overall, I feel like th this, it's obviously not the end of our story and Sasha probably isn't going to be independent at 18, like some children are and like our older daughter is, but I know that she will end up doing what is right for her. That's always been very strong and that's not following a traditional path of educational work, but there will be something. Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling okay at the moment. Yeah, and I think that our kids have so much opportunity now mm. compared to if 
our kids were growing up at the same time that we were growing up, then there was only one path. You go to school, you go get a job and you have a family yeah. and, or it felt like there was one path. And now there's, I mean, there's infinite number of paths at this point. Yeah. And for Sasha, working at home is probably going to be a thing because being out in public and mixing with other people is not something that makes her feel um, good. And she's totally fine with that. And there, there will be opportunities for that. Yeah. So you mentioned that even things she enjoys can feel like a demand. And so that brings me to the next part. Connection can be really hard when you're trying to connect with a PDA and a kid who, even though they enjoy the thing, it brings up all this internal anxiety and stress for them. Are there some tips you have or some ideas around connection for parents who are listening to this and they're struggling to build that connection with their kid? Yeah, I, like you said, it is really difficult. And for us as well, Sasha's, her language, there was a language delay initially, but a very quick catch up. And that was said to be one of the characteristics of PDA initially, although they've, they've dropped that because we don't think that applies to everyone. But that was something that for us drew us to that as well. But so her, her language skills are brilliant, but she doesn't enjoy talking about anything that's not topic of her choice, for example. So conversation is not flowing generally. And for her, too much talking is very much a bad thing. So, so we don't really get that chance to sit down and talk in any detail about lots of things to do with life. It's about managing that and understanding what are the important things to say and when to say them. So trying to, to not say things in the heat of the moment and pre-planning. So I, I would say planning is, is a big word in my life, as in forward planning and thinking about situations and what might happen. Offering choices, not saying what has to happen, being totally flexible, so realizing that things might not go to any plan I've made. But the plans I make are all with her in mind, so I'm not just deciding what I want to happen. I would take her views in that as well in whatever way I can. But it's the connection bit for me is about with, with PDA, there's a big thing about trust. And I know Sasha trusts that I understand her. So she is more likely to be able to do things for me or with me because of that trust and that relationship that we've built up. And you can only build that up when you really show someone that you're understanding what is making life difficult for them. And it's about the little things. It's not about just the fact that school is difficult. It's about mm -hmm. that different people might be difficult for different people, if that makes sense. So yeah, lots of little things, I think, build it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those micro moments mm -hmm. really build up that connection instead of this big, like, it's time for us to have one on one time, which would probably send up a lot of red flags for yeah. Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I know before we jumped on, you were talking about how on our podcast, we talk about screen time, or we talk about these different struggles that parents are going through. And I'm sure in the last 14 years, you've dealt with your fair share of parenting struggles with Sasha. Can you just talk a little bit about what that looks like when you're dealing with screens or you're dealing with bath or you're dealing with something that could be a small thing, but could blow up into a big thing if you're not using the right language or mm -hmm. something like that? Yeah. So, I mean, two things spring to mind there and the first is screen time and you know, in our house, we haven't really imposed restrictions on screen time. And I know that's not suitable for every family. So, it, and with most things, with everything, really, I think it does depend on the family and the situation. So I can't speak for others. But for us, if we'd imposed those limits, then that would have just made life a whole lot more difficult. But for us, Sasha has been able to to regulate herself. So although she's she loves gaming, but she won't get over excited I say that when she was young she would get overexcited or about not winning but she didn't really have the problem with stopping and she's been able to teach herself how to do that at the times and you know, some of that is because if you let them then they will learn from those mistakes and what's happening so yeah screen time has been an interesting one but that also um, leads me to thinking about a teacher who once asked me, don't we have any boundaries for our daughter? 
And I'm like, that, that's not what it's about. She has boundaries. She knows right from wrong. That's uh, the important boundaries. But we are more relaxed than many in terms of the demands because we've had to be. Again, it's, it's not a choice mm-hmm. from us to just not do anything. It's not lazy parenting. <laughs> in fact, it's very mm-hmm. intense parenting, I would say. It's the opposite mm-hmm. where we think about everything. And I try to encourage in many ways, but I have to think about how I'm doing that as well. So yeah, screen time is one. And then another area would be the self hygiene and teeth brushing, for example, is something again, that our older daughter can do fine morning and night. That's not an issue. So it's not that I haven't been able to, to teach either of my daughters this one daughter was fine with that routine. Our other daughter needed more encouragement when she was younger. It was a case of using an app that had silly music and she could dance along to and did it at the same time as her sister. There were kind of strategies we put in place to try and help. But then as she got older and actually when she was going to school regularly, then it was part of the routine for her. But when school issues started, then toothbrushing became more of a problem and we would go a week, maybe even two weeks with no teeth brushing. And I think a lot of parents feel too scared to say that because they can almost hear the gasps from other parents in the community about, oh my God, how can you do that? How can you not make your child brush their teeth? All their teeth are going to fall out. And again, we're quite lucky because Sasha only drinks water and doesn't eat sweets. If her teeth are very good and she's never had a filling or any problems, but she has been for, through a lot of time where she hasn't done it. And then more recently, when life has become more calm, she has gone back to it and it's once a day now, and that is fine, but it's had to be when she was ready on her terms. We've just learned that as we've gone. I love that. And I always think of it as this is not a forever plan. You're reducing and dropping some of these demands or expectations so that your child can feel safe in their skin so that they can handle the other stressors that are going on that are more important and schooling and feeling safe in your own body is far more important. Feeling belonging is far more important than having clean teeth. So I I love that you shared that. And another thing with PJ, I know that Sasha puts a lot of this pressure on herself. So she knows Mm -hmm. that she should be doing this, but she just can't do it. But that makes her feel worse about herself. So there's no point in me piling more pressure on top of that. It's just adding to what is already a difficult situation. So yeah, we just, we manage it carefully by thinking about everything. What do you do with the outside pressure? Again, as we're talking about those questions that then become our own beliefs or thoughts of, well, when is she ever going to learn? Are we just allowing her to never do these things? What do you, how do you handle that? Yeah, and, and that is difficult. And I see a lot of parents struggling with that. And again, because we're so caught up in this system that children learn at a certain age, they all go to school at the same time at 16 here, they all do big exams. Then again, at 18 and, and you just get caught up in this. But when you stop to think about it, you could really think, but why, why do they need to do that? And actually our our children's learning, it is very different for each of them really. And yeah, it's great if like our older daughter, she could go and do that with the masses and went through on those kind of timescales. But for our younger daughter, it's just not possible. So we can, again, there's no point in trying to force that. We just um, go with the flow. But this kind of leads back to screen time though, is that she has learned so much from from watching a lot of YouTube, a lot of people would look down on and think that's awful as a parent to let your child watch YouTube. But she, she knows she could probably tell you all of the states in America and I can't do that. <laughs> and there's probably people in America maybe who can't do that. But she has learned a lot, a lot from the internet. Um, but yeah, we're, we're okay with, with the fact that she probably is not going to sit um, typical exams here. And that doesn't mean that she doesn't have the intelligence levels to do Mm -hmm. that. It means that her anxiety is too great to be forced. And also she doesn't understand why. It doesn't make sense when you stop and think about why do you have to have passed a test in English and maths in order to be able to do graphic design, for example. It's, It's not logical. The kind of tests they're doing and the questions they're asking in these tests aren't always logical. I've gone back and looked at some now and I've thought, it doesn't make sense to me the way they're teaching some of, some of these subjects these days. So yeah, and that's I, I went to university and did a degree and was perfectly fine with that myself, but yeah, it's not going to be for her. Yeah. 
I love it. It's just adjusting our expectations and changing what we thought it was going to look like or what we yeah. thought the path was going to yeah. look like. And, and I'll just add to that look. because I've just said something that I try not to ne to say, and that's I don't want never say never because yes. I'm saying right now she is not going to study for a degree, but maybe in four or five years time, she will decide that's what she wants to do and she can do it then, um, you know, on her, her own terms when she's ready. Absolutely. And I didn't even catch the never. And so I'm glad you caught that. That's fantastic. So we talked a little bit about signs to look out for PDA. And we've talked about how it's that underlying feeling of being unsafe, that anxiety. But you also touched on sensory needs. And I feel like every human on the planet needs to understand sensory and we'd have a very different planet <laughs> because it's just not talked about enough. Yeah. So I know sensory is one of the things, but are there some things that you feel like parents who have PDA kids just need to understand about their kids, the anxiety piece, the sensory piece? What are some things you feel like need to be discussed? That's really difficult. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we can, what is it about the anxiety piece or the sensory piece that you feel like people just need to know? Yes. And again, it's going back to that. Every individual is, is different. All those profiles are different. So the sensory where one child might be struggling with a noise and need headphones, another might not, but that same child might be okay walking into a public restroom with the hand dryer going off. Um, but they might have they might have sensory issues with sound in a different way at the same time. It's so complex. There's so many different um, strands to this and you can't assume that every child is going to have the same profile, the same mix of strengths uh, and challenges. Yeah. And I think we could also just unravel what does it mean by demands? Because I think when people hear the word demand, they think that it is exactly what it sounds like, go do this. And I think demands are far different than just that. Can you explain a little bit about what is a demand? Yeah, so that what you were saying would be a direct demand. And uh, this comes into how we use different language with uh, PDAs generally, but definitely in our house. So we don't say you must do something or you need to do something or you have to do this. We use different language to say, that might sound a bit flowery now, but maybe it would be good if we did that for example but yeah so they're direct demands where you're expecting someone else to do it but then there's indirect demands demands that you might not expect for example having a menu there's a lot of choice on that demand but you're expected to pick something off that menu or you are if you don't realize that you can ask and uh, see if something else is possible but there's still that um, expectation that demand that you have to have something off that but most people would go but a menu is a nice thing you're getting a choice of what you might want but so there's demands like that there's also like time time is a huge demand that pressure of time and having to do things by for a certain time scale. And so an example, if you wanted to go to the cinema, obviously they start the showing at a certain time for everyone else. But if you're struggling to get out of the house and you can't make it there for that time, that, that's adding that pressure. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's lots of hidden demands. Peer pressure is a real big demand. Um, expectations of things like birthdays or Christmas holidays, um, mm -hmm. where people do these funny little routines that actually when you start thinking about it don't make much sense that you all open presents on a certain day morning around the tree with everyone present so yeah having to rethink all of that is interesting when it comes to PDA as well. I think that's super helpful for people who might have been hearing this word demand be thrown around but in their head they might have only thought of it as those very direct request and not it, what you are talking about really is that pressure, mm. that outside pressure, that internal pressure and that expectation. So I think if we can think of it that way, that can help people understand what we're talking about here and why it builds up so much anxiety in our kids. And then therefore the avoidance, yes. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the avoidance is just what the end of all of this other yeah. stuff that's going on. And I know a lot of self-advocates like to use the persistent design desire for autonomy mm -hmm. as the definition of PDA. And so I think if we can think of that expectation, that pressure, and then we're like, oh, wait, they want to feel their own autonomy in that situation. I think that also helps a lot. Yeah, because that makes you feel safe again, doesn't it? And knowing yeah. what's going to happen, that, that fear of the unknown is a big thing of, of not knowing. So again, that brings in the anxiety, doesn't it? Um, yeah. So yeah, Sa but Sasha's, I don't know that she, she wouldn't see that or understand that as a drive for autonomy herself 
but it's okay. just always been there that she needs that to be in control of herself and what's happening yeah. for her to keep those anxiety levels low. Okay. And so talking about, <coughs> sorry, talking about some of the ways that you mentioned we can provide some choices, we can talk around, not be direct with you must do this, but instead maybe this might be a good idea. What are you thinking type? of thing might help. What are some other ways that we can empower our kids, empower our PDAers while also feeling like we're making some sort of progress in helping our kids along the journey? Yeah. And uh, this feeds into uh, something that's difficult for all parents, certainly of teenagers, when you get to a certain age is they often don't want to think, hear things from us either. <laughs> so involving a third person when they're younger, maybe a third person such as the pool is closing now that the pool manager says we have to get out. So it's not the parent putting that demand on the child to get out of the pool. So being a bit, a bit, yeah, kind of. Clever, when, when they're younger, it's not, I think some people worry that it's kind of tricking them or not telling them the truth, but it's not that. It's just trying to phrase it in a way that, that keeps the anxiety low again. I like the idea of bringing in a third person that is really helpful. And we mentioned, you mentioned offering choice and you mentioned changing the language. Are there any scripts or any... And I know, again, it's very dependent on each individual, but are there any like sentence starters or language help that you could leave listeners that could help them in shifting the way they are talking to their kids, especially their kids with PDA? Just being less demanding is how I would phrase it. But I always say, I think I say this in the book that I, the word no, it was one of our daughter's favorite words from a young age, but only if she was the one using it. So we weren't allowed to say no, because that would send everything off the scale into complete meltdown. So having that barrier, that firm barrier was, we learned very quickly that didn't work. But if she was going to be in danger, then yes, we would use the word no or stop or whatever was necessary. But otherwise, what would you use instead? Sorry? What would what would you replace the no or stop or don't do that? Yeah. With? So it, if it was an immediate thing and you had to and there was danger, then yes, you use that kind of language. But that that really hasn't happened very much for us. If it was, oh, I want to go to the park today, I'd say, well, it's it's not possible to do that today because it's going to rain in the next hour. But maybe we could do that tomorrow or next week or coming mm -hmm. up with other alternatives, a bit of distraction. Humor is really good. And especially found this with Sasha's dad, who has written one of the chapters in the book, which I think is good because you don't very often hear a male carer's point of view. Um, but your know, relationship with her is, of course, very different to mine because he's not spent as much time in the house with her. So that does um, make a difference. But his um, relationship is definitely based on humor and being a bit silly because that being fun is something that matters a lot to mm -hmm. Sasha life needs to be fun, which, which is something we should probably all embrace. But yeah, so not being too serious about things is a good recommendation. And then along those same lines, what are some things that you have used to help other people understand your different way of parenting and your different approach with Sasha, knowing that one, it's exactly what she needs and you're seeing the results of that. But how do you have things that you just have at the ready of ways that you can explain it to the school or you can explain it to maybe in-laws or people like that? Yeah, it's been really, for me, it's been good that I started the blog. And as I said, I had no idea where it was going to take me. So I didn't do it with this in mind. But I think having been able to write honestly about our experiences from the start has meant other people have listened a bit to that. So we haven't been challenged too much. We have great family and friends who've just been very understanding and we're extremely lucky in that because that support means a lot. We do know there are some who just don't believe this is a thing. I just, I, I wouldn't make all of this up. It, it's not, it would be easier to have been a typical parent. But yeah, I, I know that's going on, but we just have to stay strong in, in our belief that we know what is, you know, what is best for our daughter and what, what we are doing is right by her. But yeah, I know that other, some other people find that very difficult. I guess the, I do recommend the PDA Society website. They have great one page information documents that can be sent to schools, for example. They've done some for healthcare professionals. 
they are involved in ongoing research. A great charity who've helped so many families. They would be my first port of call. And then there's some books that I recommend on my blog. Not everyone has time to read a book, but there's some that are quite small. So yeah, just- What are some of your favorite ones? Oh, my favorite book was the, the one, the, the main one I say, it was the one done the longest time ago. It's called Understanding Pathological Demand Avoidance Syndrome in Children by Mouseful, but um, it was like reading about my daughter. So it fully explained it. So for me, I was like, wow, it's like somebody has met my daughter, even though they haven't. But there's another one called Can I Tell You About Pathological Demand Avoidance that is told from the viewpoint of an 11 year old girl, which helped mm -hmm. me because back then a lot of literature about autism was about boys still. So that was something that also I wanted to talk more about girls and autism is very much a thing. But yeah, that one was good for me for that. And then oh, mm -hmm. there's te books for teachers and educators and therapists on PDA, there's lots. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll include those links below. We'll include the link to your blog where you talk about the books, your book list, and then obviously everyone should get your book, PDA in the Family. And before we head out, I like to ask everyone that comes on the podcast this question. I would love for you to imagine that you are sitting in front of a parent who has a newly diagnosed kiddo that is PDA and they are just not sure where to go, what to do. And you only have one or two minutes to let them know what they need to hear. So what would you say to them? Oh, I'd start by saying don't do things for other people. So ignore those expectations from society. Start to, to change your mindset, to become a detective about what really works for your child, because it is going to be individual. I'd say that school doesn't have to happen in the way that lots of people think it does when children are younger. And yeah, the PDA Society, as I've said, are signposts towards more information. And other people, I think, finding other families who've had this experience, so not just the autism experience, which can be very different um, for other individuals, but PDA specific, I found great um, comfort and support within the PDA community. And listening to PDA adults for me has been a really big thing and get, getting those insights has really helped. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for everything you've shared, for being vulnerable, sharing your insights and your stories with us. It has been such an honor to have you on here. Where can people find out more about you and about your book? Okay, my blog, thank you very much for having me on, by the way. My book, my blog, sorry, is Steph's Two Girls. So www.stephstwogirls.co.uk. And the book is PDA and the Family, and it is available on Amazon across the world, I believe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got it on US Amazon, so it's definitely available um, in the US and around the world. So thank you again for coming on. And for those of you listening, if anything has resonated with you, please reach out, reach out to Steph, reach out to me, let us know that this episode really resonated with you and it helped you and supported you and tell us exactly what it was. It really makes a difference when people reach out and let us know. And you can go to your favorite podcasting platform, you could leave a review that also helps it leaves a big smile on my face for sure but I want you to leave really hearing what Steph was saying is to let go of those outside expectations of what the world is placing on you and what society is saying you should do and know that you are exactly the parent your kid needs and your kid is not broken. They're exactly who they are designed to be and they just need you to be there, to hear them, to see them and to figure out a way of parenting that fits them and your unique family. So with that, I am excited to talk to you guys again next week and have a great day. Bye, guys.